All right, chapter 10 is all about polymers, which is an offshoot of organic chemistry. And let's briefly define what a polymer is. Does anybody know what a polymer is? What does poly mean? Many, right? So it's many mers, right? So a polymer is something that is made up of many parts. Specifically, what you have is a repeating chain of monomers. So if you imagine a metal chain, right, you've got individual links. A polymer would be a bunch of those all linked together, right? So that's the most basic way we can describe a polymer. But let's take an example of a common polymer that's made from this starting material. What would this starting material be called? It's an alkene with two carbons. Not everybody all at once. <laughs> Prefix for two carbons? F, right? So it would be ethene. However, oftentimes people will call this ethylene. Flows off the tongue a little bit better. And this is going to be our monomer. And when you take this monomer, what you're going to do is basically polymerize this into one big long chain. And I'll show you guys how to write out chains. And over here, we've got the polymer product. Does anybody know what this would be called if the monomer is ethylene? Yeah, if it's three units, what if it goes on forever? So I'm just going to put an N here saying it can go on for a theoretically infinite amount. Just put the word poly in front. It would be poly, polyethylene, right? Has anybody heard of polyethylene? Polyethylene is one of the most common plastics that you'll see on a day-to-day -day basis. So, like your Mountain Dew bottle right there is actually made up of polyethylene. Most plastics are made up of polyethylene that are consumer-grade plastics. So it's everywhere. It's used in a lot of um, applications. Yep? So is it still um, have to eat any stomachs if it's only single one of them? Yeah, it's weird. So because it's made up of polyethylene, or sorry, ethylene monomers uh, uh, suffix stays, so it's still polyethylene, not polyethylene, mm -hmm. I guess. So how would you know that by just, if you were only given the right, or would you not only be given the right? I'm not going to be picky about naming it, I just wanted to show you guys what polyethylene looks like. So I want you guys to be able to decipher, hey, if you look at this monomer on the left, you may notice this goes from having a double bond to all single bonds. This is referred to as an addition polymerization, meaning you're just adding them together and not losing anything in the process. Um, but we'll talk more about uh, polymerization reactions a little later. Does that make sense? What's the shape, using Vesper theory, of the carbon for the monomer? Is it linear? Is it tetrahedral? Is it trigonal pyramidal? How would we describe it? So it's got three bonded atoms around each carbon. Can lay flat. Trigonal planar. So these, as monomers, can lay flat. But what do you notice about the polymer? What shape does it adopt after it polymerizes? So now it has four atoms around each carbon. Tetrahedral.
So polymerization can change the properties a lot, right? So ethylene is actually <coughs> gas that's derived from natural gas, and polyethylene is a solid, right? And um, the geometry of it changes a fair amount during this process. So you can actually imagine it as being a big, long chain that can theoretically go on for an infinite amount. So let's make a little note of that. So theoretically, this chain can go on forever, and there are reactions can be done to allow for branching. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a long single chain. It can actually be a big spider web of chains coming off of that, and it's controlled a lot by the polymerization process. We're not going to get into it, though. But the two big things that impact the properties of plastics are how long they are and how much branching they have. So properties are affected by polymer length. You could also call this the weight or mass of the polymer and the branching. Does that make sense? We're not going to go into all the nitty gritty details behind the polymerization process, but I want you to know what a monomer is versus a polymer. So let's take a look at some of the ethylene polymers, just because I think they're pretty interesting. One of them is called HDPE. And if you're into recycling, which I hope you all are, it has that little symbol 2 around it. So if you look underneath your uh, water bottle, like that Mountain Dew one, it probably has that stamped on there. What do you think the HD stands for? It's not high definition. <laughs> high density. This is really common. It's mostly unbranched. It packs tightly because it's unbranched. And it's also rigid. It is good for bottles and other consumer goods. The neat thing is with these plastics, we can actually recycle them and turn them into new products after they're recycled. So theoretically, once you make a plastic, you can recycle it forever. Um, plastics are actually very, very green products if they're recycled. The big problem is if people throw them in the trash can, then they just end up in a landfill as waste. So we'll talk about that. There's things called plasticizers that are added to plastics. And those plasticizers under certain conditions will leach out into your water. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard about BPA or BPA-free water bottles. That's a plasticizer or a polymer component. And when it leaches out of the bottle into your water, you'll drink it and it will actually disrupt your hormone system a little bit. And if you have a large amount of it, it's been proven to really mess up your body. The question is, how much of it is a safe amount? And that's still a little bit unclear. Um, there are a lot of people out there that say any amount is unsafe. But it's like, well, what if it's in a part per trillion level? Um, is that really worth worrying about? So it, it's still up for debate, but we'll talk about that in a second. There's also another type of polyethylene called LDPE. This is with the number four on it for the recycle symbol. And this is low density polyethylene. This is also commonly found in consumer goods. This one's mostly branched. 
So if it's mostly branched, do you think it's going to behave the same as high-density polyethylene? No? Do you think it'll be softer, harder? Softer. So this is a softer plastic because it can't pack as tightly. Softer plastic. It's normally not found in foams, but if you've ever picked up a white, uh, sorry, a bike water bottle, you notice that those are squishier. They almost feel waxy. They're still polyethylene, but they're highly branched polyethylene. So they're low density polyethylene. So that's my favorite example is a bike water bottle. You can imagine if you had something like that Mountain Dew plastic bottle, it wouldn't work very well on a bike ride because you can't squeeze it. It's a lot more rigid where the other, I guess you can a little. <laughs> Although I wouldn't drink Mountain Dew on a bike ride. Um, white bike water bottles are a lot um, softer and easier to uh, squeeze. All right, there are a bunch of things though we have to be aware of with plastics that I briefly mentioned on. All right, health and environmental impact impacts. So let's start with environmental. Actually, sorry, let's start with health. I'm going to do it out of order. Plasticizers can leach out of some plastics. and can lead to hormone disruption. Oh. These are called indoctrine disruptors. Oh. No T. And an example that we mentioned briefly is a BPA. So if you can, for your water bottles, always try to find BPA-free water bottles. Those have been proven to be much safer. Um, oftentimes people think, hey, I got an aluminum water bottle. An aluminum water bottle isn't made of plastic, right? So it's a lot safer. It's actually been proven not to be true for a lot of those aluminum bottles. Do you guys know why? They actually line the inside of the cheap ones with plastic. <laughs> so you have to be really careful with what you buy to see that BPA-free symbol on there to make sure that what you're getting is, in fact, legitimate. Just because the outside's made of metal doesn't mean the inside's not coated with the plastic. Do you know about hydroflask? Hydroflask? I think those are all BPA-free. Yeah. They're pretty expensive, but they're nice. Yeah, they're really good. Yeah. So BPA is the big health impact that most people are aware of. The environmental ones are also pretty important. What's a bad environmental impact of plastics? Yeah, it produces a lot of garbage. If not recycled. Which is why it's super important to recycle plastics because they don't break down in the environment, at least most plastics. There are a few biodegradable ones, but the vast majority of them will not decompose very quickly. And you've probably heard about the giant floating plastic patch in the ocean. What happens is these currents will basically form vortexes, collect all this plastic, and then just dump it in areas. Or animals will eat it if it turns into microplastics. It's a really big problem um, ecologically. The other thing that's a big problem is where do we get those monomers? From oil and natural gas, right? So most monomers are from petroleum products. And we know Drilling for petroleum products isn't always the greenest process, and there can be accidents and things like that, right? So I saw this in Seattle a few years ago, and it made me laugh a little bit. 
So these protesters went out and they were protesting a big oil drilling platform going up to Alaska. But the thing that struck out to me as a chemist is I see all these people in kayaks, right? What are kayaks made out of? Plastics, right? <laughs> so it's kind of a little bit ironic here that they were protesting the production of oil even though they were riding around in something made from oil. So it's something to be aware of. Plastics are made from petroleum products, right? So let's make a note of that. I think it's really easy for us to kind of lose sight of where things come from. We just always imagine going to REI and picking up a kayak. We don't imagine the process of drilling down for oil, polymerizing it into a plastic, and then casting it into a, a full product like a kayak. Does that make sense? Try not to get super political here. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about addition polymers. Addition polymers are ones like ethylene, where we take a monomer and we polymerize it. And there's a bunch of really cool ones, so I wanted to go over these, but let's describe them a little bit. They convert a CC double bond into a polymer of CC bonds. So we're going from an alkene to an alkane. They produce no byproducts. So they're really common for making plastics. They're thought of as a green reaction because you're not producing a lot of waste. So let's take a look at a monomer. And we'll look at the polymer. And then we'll do the name over here. But a lot of these you might recognize. So we already did the first one, so I'm just going to repeat it just so we've got everything in one nice list. We said this was ethylene. We said the polymer was polyethylene, so I'll just do two repeating units in brackets. And I'm just going to put a bunch of H's on here. And theoretically, that could continue on forever. And we said the name of this is polyethylene. All right, let's try a new monomer. I want you guys to help me name this. What would this monomer be called? We now have three carbons with an alkene. So what's the prefix for three? Prop. So what would the suffix be if it's prop? Propene or propylene, depending on the naming system you use. Most people will call this propylene, kind of like ethylene. Okay, so let's polymerize this. Well, we'll do another long repeating chain of four carbons. Okay, so we've got a hydrogen here, but the next carbon over, we now have a methyl group, a CH3, and we've got a hydrogen and then a CH3. You guys kind of see how it's repeating that way? I'm gonna move this up. And then on the lower side, we just have hydrogens. So really, every other carbon along the chain has a methyl group coming off of it. What do you think the name of this is going to be? Polypropylene. Does anybody recognize that name? So polypropylene is very common. It's found in a lot of carpets. In fact, most carpets are made of polypropylene, and it's found a lot in clothing. So, for example, when I go camping, I refuse to bring cotton with me. Does anybody know why? It absorbs water and you get super duper cold and you never feel warm ever again. Like It's miserable wearing cotton when it's raining out. Polypropylene, on the other hand, you can be very wet, but it keeps you nice and warm. So it's kind of like a synthetic wool in that way. Yep. So Gore-Tex is a little bit different. 
Um, I don't think we'll have time to talk about it, but maybe um, after lab I can show you what that's made out of. Yep. We're going to talk about that. That's a different type of polymer. Yeah, that's up next. <laughs> All right, so polypropylene is really common. Here's another really common one. Instead of hydrogens, we're going to put in a lot of fluorines. So four fluorines. Maybe that F looks bad. There we go. All right, so this is tetrafluoro for the fluor four fluorines, ethylene. All right, so again, I'm going to do two repeating units of this polymer. And off of each of these carbons, we'll have a fluorine. This is referred to as polytetrafluoroethylene. Very creative, right? Does anybody know the common name for this? So you may see it on plastics labeled as PTFE because that's a mouthful to say polytetrafluoroethylene. However, the brand name for this is Teflon. So I'm sure a lot of you have pans that have Teflon coating on them. What's special about Teflon? It's non-stick, right? So you, yeah, food doesn't stick very well. Why do you think it won't stick very well? It's really, really hydrophobic, right? So in this case, it's not attracted to water at all. The problem with uh, Teflon that I wanted to warn you guys about is that it starts to decompose at really high temperatures. So if you actually read the pans, they say do not heat to high temperatures with oil, or else it will start to break down the Teflon, and you can actually ingest little chips of it and things like that, and it can cause um, noxious gases to be produced. There's also a bunch of uh, fluorinated po uh, polymers out there that are used in uh, ski waxes, and what they're finding out more and more is a lot of these ski waxes that have a bunch of fluorines on them bioaccumulate and cause um, really bad problems for the environment. So if you do get your skis waxed, check to see what sort of wax they're using and try to get a non-fluorinated wax. Those ones aren't the best. They make you ski really fast because they're non-stick, but they bioaccumulate. All right, one last one because I like plastics. So this one has one chlorine coming off of it. And this is called chloroethylene. Or it's oftentimes referred to as vinyl chloride. And again, we'll do two units. So we'll have a chlorine on one carbon skip the next one because that has two hydrogens, chlorine on the next one, and then skip the next one because it has two hydrogens. This is referred to as polyvinyl chloride. Does anybody know what most people will call polyvinyl chloride? PVC. Does anybody know what PVC is used in? pipes, right? So a lot of your piping in your house might be made of PVC. It's a really strong, durable plastic. Um, in fact, a lot of municipalities are going through the process of replacing old lead pipes with PVC pipe because obviously it's a lot safer than lead. How many of you have been following the Flint water crisis at all? So the Flint water crisis is a really big deal. Um, if you get a chance on PBS, there's a documentary called Poisoned about the Flint water crisis, but essentially what happened was they changed the water source for the city from, uh, I think, Lake Huron to the local river. And when they did that, the pH changed really quickly, and then they had to treat it differently because lake water has to be treated differently than river water. And when they did that, but essentially the whole interior of the pipe that was nice and scaled up um, due to years of use flaked off. When that flaked off, not only did the residents notice a bunch of rusty, gross-looking water that smelled bad, 
But then they also started noticing the lead effects. So after all of that interior scaling fell off, the lead pipes were exposed. And then you had lead atoms going into the water and poisoning people. So I think the uh, allowable amount of lead in drinking water is about 15 parts per billion, but a lot of houses out there had um, something like 15,000 parts per billion. So it was really bad, and they're trying to go through and replace a lot of those pipes with more benign pipes like copper. Copper is really expensive, or PVC. Yep. It actually happened in Massachusetts in, like, I think in the 90s, too. Yep. And there's a movie about it with John Fulton. Happened in Washington, D.C. as well. It's like we don't learn from our mistakes. But that's what happens when people cheap out and try to find a new water source is they don't anticipate all the obstacles of doing that. You want to know the thing that will really outrage you is it could have been fixed with $100 a week of treatment. $100 a week could have prevented Flint. Sorry, I'll get off my soapbox and we can talk about other stuff. <laughs> so addition polymers like we saw typically involve an alkene getting converted to an alkane, but there are other polymers called condensation polymers. These are polymers that create a byproduct. So the byproducts that are typically produced with condensation polymers are byproducts like water or hydrochloric acid or some sort of small molecule falls off in the process of this polymerization reaction. So I'll show you guys a cool one. This is called ethylene glycol. And what they do when they polymerize it is they polymerize it with this carboxylic acid over here. I'm not gonna show all the carbons, I'm gonna switch to bond line for the acid. But if you remember, when we talked about this earlier, that position, this position, this position. Anytime you see a zig or a zag, that's an assumed carbon with hydrogens off of it, if there are hydrogens. So we've got an acid on this side and a carboxylic acid on this side. But what occurs is those two pieces that are circled will combine and form water. So let's try to figure out what this polymer might look like. plus water. So can you guys kind of see how we link those two together? It's a little bit confusing, but because we've got a carboxylic acid off of both sides, we can continue doing this down an infinite chain. So let's take a look at this. What functional group was this again? Carboxylic acid. What's our new functional group? It's not a carboxylic acid. We don't have an OH. An ester. So an ester is where you have that oxygen with some sort of carbon coming off. So you combine this ethylene glycol with this dye acid called terephthalic acid. And you make a new ester linkage between those units and you can continue connecting them together into this super long chain. What do you guys think this plastic might be called? Give you a hint, there are many esters in it. Polyester. So there's this guy down here. And this guy is wearing a sweet suit made of polyester. Does anybody know why polyester became so popular? A lot of 
if you pull it. <laughs> it's cheap, so you can manufacture it easily. Um, cotton, growing cotton takes a huge amount of resources, right? So cotton requires a lot of water, a lot of fertilizer, a lot of labor to not only pick it, but to process it, where polyester is super cheap to manufacture. My favorite thing about polyester is you don't have to iron it. Cotton clothes, you have to iron all the time, right? So that's really what the big boom was with polyester, is it allowed people not to have to iron all their clothes. Um, so it's a pretty unique uh, plastic in that way. The cool thing is you can um, recycle a lot of consumer grade plastics and actually make um, clothing out of those plastics too. They aren't quite polyester, but that's the neat thing with recycling is you can keep on reusing those plastics over and over. I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen those um, grocery bags, right? The reusable ones, those are normally made from uh, recycled plastic. All right, we'll do, I think, one more. This is another unique one. Actually, I'm going to draw in my carbons. And again, I'm not going to draw all the carbons here. Just to save a little time, we'll go with bond line. So we're going to do a condensation polymerization. The molecule on the left is called phosgene. It was actually a war gas in World War I, but now it's used primarily for making plastics. What do you think the small molecule will be that pops off. We don't have a carboxylic acid anymore. What do you guys think? HCL. HCL, exactly. So if we look at this, these two units will fall off and then we'll create a linkage. And you can continue doing this on both sides of each molecule and create a super long chain. So let's make one repeating unit of this. So this is a really interesting plastic. This plastic is called polycarbonate. Have you guys heard of that? What is polycarbonate found in? It's really heavy duty plastic. So like fish tanks are oftentimes made of polycarbonate. The super rigid Nalgene bottles, at least the old ones, were made of polycarbonate. The one bad thing about polycarbonate is the starting materials, right? So one's a war gas. So this is phosgene. Not easy to work with on an industrial scale. The other monomer that we have in here is bisphenol A. Also known as BPA. That's why a lot of the polycarbonate water bottles are being phased out um, in favor of newer plastics that are BPA free. So polycarbonate is a really strong, durable plastic. It can be used over and over and over and over again and won't degrade very readily. However, it does have that problem with BPA. All right, one last one, I promise. We do have a few more minutes. This one's one of my favorites. And for those of you in the military, you may recognize this one. All right, what small molecule do you think will pop off for this condensation reaction? HCl. Okay, I agree. All right, so let's piece this together. So 
So what sort of linkage do we have now? What sort of bond have we made? Or functional group, I should say. Amid. Amids are unusually strong bonds, which is good, right? We don't want our proteins to accidentally fall apart. So this bond is very strong, which makes this polymer exceptionally strong. This polymer is known as Kevlar. What is Kevlar used in? Yeah, bulletproof vests, right? Yeah, and helmets. The other thing that Kevlar is used in that a lot of people don't know about is they wrap um, space capsules in it um, in order to prevent flying debris from going straight through a spaceship. So it's used a lot. Um, and I think it's pretty impressive how powerful it is. So I just wanted to show you guys this video because I think it's pretty neat. All right, here's the Kevlar test. The thing that impresses me is how few layers of Kevlar it takes to stop a uh, high caliber round. Oh yeah. It will break your ribs and you'll get a horrendous bruise, which is why oftentimes they still put metal plating behind it. So to give you a perspective, that was five sheets of Kevlar for the most powerful handgun in the world. That was all it took to stop that. However, the kinetic energy, like I said, will likely break your ribs and even potentially kill you unless you've got a steel plate behind it. So most bulletproof vests have combos of steel plates or hard plastic and Kevlar um, plastic sheets in it. But pretty interesting. <laughs> all right, that's it for polymers, believe it or not. Um, if you want to get started on sapling, I tried to trim down the problem set as much as I could. Um, so you can start working on that. Um, the next chapter, we're just going to be working on biopolymers, or sorry, biomolecules.